Um, so, so the other thing is we are recording these um, so that we can upload them to our website so other people have the opportunity to be able to see them over time. Today we have Sean Swindler, who is um, the Director of Community Program Development at the Kansas Center for Autism Research and Training. A lot of you on this call probably know it as KCART. We've been around for a while. We do a lot of autism-based um, service provider training, behavior specialist training. Sean's been fully integrated into that for um, many years now. We won't say how long, Sean. Um, next slide. there. So um, for the first five minutes are these introductions, and then Sean's going to present for probably somewhere around 40 minutes-ish, I think. Um, so he may go over because he tends to be long-winded. Um, sorry, Sean. <laughs> That's a joke for everybody on here. I know Sean personally. Um, followed by like a group discussion. Um, we can have that group discussion within the presentation. If, um, if you see this level up sign in the presentation, um, there may be an opportunity for you to chat or present comments in the chat. Um, next slide. So there is gonna be, because with any funder, right? People, the state is gonna wanna make sure that we're reaching people and that we're doing the job that we say we're gonna do. So um, the assessments are kind of twofold. We want to know if you learned what you thought you were gonna learn from Sean's presentation today, but also we wanna make sure that there's things that we can do to improve our training because we really want to continue to reach, reach a broader audience. Next slide. Uh, Sean, um, the, um, this is mitigating potential bias. The information that he's gonna present is based on evidence that's currently accepted within the profession. Next slide. Up, oh, go back one more slide. So let me now do my introduction of, oh no, go to the next slide. So um, um, this is that PBS model. I'm sorry, Sean, would you back up one? Um, which looks at the primary level um, with the thought being that the more that you can put in at a primary level, the less likely it is that our, the people that we work with are gonna require secondary prevention or small group instruction. And then if we can get supports put in for that secondary level, it's going to prevent the need for that tertiary level intervention or treatment. And this goes across the board, right? So part of what we're trying to do is provide that primary prevention. So we're disseminating information about how to get supports in place so that we prevent our kids from being in the secondary or tertiary spot. So now, Sean, go to the next one. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce my good friend, Sean Swindler, who is um, currently the Director of Community Program and Development at KCAR. He's been with us since 2008, right, Sean? And before that, Sean and I knew each other back when he was a um, case manager out in the field. <laughs> <laughs> And so um, we, of all the people that I know that is a good advocate, it's Sean. And anytime I get a question about something that I'm not familiar with, my go-to person is Sean Swindler. Here, let me connect you to Sean Swindler. Do you have a problem with social security? Here, let me connect you to Sean Swindler. Do you have a question about transition services? Let me connect you to Sean Swindler because Sean, Sean is in that brain of his, he's got all the information that you are gonna to need to know if you live in Kansas. And so, um, sorry, Sean, I just probably made your job a lot harder. <laughs> so anyway, without me talking anymore, I would like to introduce Sean Swindler and let him take it away. Well, thank you, Linda. I'm very excited to be here today. And I'm, I'm also the parent of a 20 year old with autism and an intellectual disability who is currently engaged in the topic that we are gonna talk about today, which is transition. And one of the things to make, an important point to make is that all kids transition. Every single kid in that high school is going to transition to, to the adult world, is going to transition to the community, and it's going to transition to employment and post-secondary education. That's no different than our kids in special education. And, and so one of those, one of those tertiary sports we talk about is 
is we need to think of transition as generic and think about tra transition as everybody does it and and our kids have a right to be supported to transition with the appropriate accommodations etc just like anybody else so we're going to take off from there so today what we're going to hope to do is to understand some of the specialized services and sports available to kids with autism as they transition um, understand some key behavioral milestones toward increasing independence and understands how families can promote self-determination and independence for their child as they're as they transition. Transition is an incredibly unnecessarily complex set of supports out there. And, and so when we start going through this, there are so many different pieces that, that have to be pulled together. When, when we look at IEP teams, especially for transition age kids, and you look around the table and you see 15 people there, it does require that 15, those 15 people, and everybody does need to do what they're supposed to do. It does take that village for this to be successful. And in so many places, some of our services and systems are not what they appear to be on paper and they are really complex to work through and really difficult for families. And ultimately it impacts our kids and that they don't get what, what we know they need. So starting with special education, um, we're all familiar with IDEA. And the purpose of IDEA is to ensure all children have available to them a free appropriate public education. And that includes their preparation for further education, employment, and independent living. So when your child's in first grade, we're still thinking a little bit about that, but boy, when they get to middle school and then high school, we're thinking a lot about what do they need to do to live as independently as possible in the community. Um, and that would include um, doing recreational things, being included in the life of the community and competitive integrated employment. So what is transition? Um, transition refers to the process of transitioning from home and school life to living in the community. And again, that vision is that people are going to be live inclusively in their community. They're going to be a part of that community life and they're going to work in competitive integrated employment. Um, the, the idea that the only place um, kids with intellectual disabilities or autism can, can be employed is some sort of sheltered setting is not where we're going now. We have to have that vision that our kids are going to be employed and they're going to live and they're going to be independent and they're going to receive the supports that they need to do that. So we talk about transition services. They're intended to prepare students to move from the world of school to the world of adulthood. And they're provided by this incredibly complex combination of community, state, and federal supports. And these also include, as we mentioned before, the generic systems available to all students with and without disabilities. And so an, an example of that is every high school has a counseling service where they wanna help kids go to college. Um, that's unfortunately kind of the sole focus of some high school counseling programs is just college is the only thing we think about. We don't think about vocational, we don't think about other options. Um, but, every, but if your kid wants to go to college and they have autism, those folks need to be able to help you do that and, and to be, need to be able to be informed enough about, about what you need to be able to do that. So special education transition services, again, really complex. And, and part of the reason it's complex is that the practice at individual school districts at the, at, at the ground level doesn't match up sometimes with the practice described in IDEA or described in state policy. And that's because you have 200 school districts and school boards and different special ed co-ops and everything. And everybody does things a little different, especially in a state like Kansas, which has a lot of emphasis on local control. And so, so different people's experience with transition is gonna be different everywhere in the state. The KSDE leadership um, is really working hard to change that. And they've worked hard to do some new policies to change that, but, but we're st that's still a lot, of, a lot of where we are. Sean, so, yeah. Um, are you okay to entertain any questions? Yeah, I, I was gonna say, please interrupt me at any time with a question and I'm okay, happy to stop. I, I will. So like when we look at this and you may are going to cover it, 
but you know we look at like this is just for like special education transition mm -hmm. services but there's like a whole that whole other set out there with cddos and anybody on here that doesn't know what a cddo is yeah, we're we're, we're going to cover all of that okay, okay. yeah because <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. it's really complicated yeah we're, we're laying the groundwork here and then we're going to hit the okay some of this other stuff um so 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 just just a, a note about that that transition services are a coordinated set of services. That means that legally, the school needs to provide coordinated set of activities that are going to promote your employment, your independent living. All of those things are based on the child's needs and take into account their strengths, preferences, and interests, um, and include, include all of the instruction related service and community experiences that are going to help them successfully transition into the community. Um, and, and so this is really the coordinated set of services is really important because in our age of budget cuts, things like that, a lot of school districts no longer have a transition specialist. And so, so they're having their special education teacher, especially in smaller districts, um, attempt to know all of the stuff I'm about to talk to you about <laughs> in too short a time. And it's incredibly complex and and so it's, it requires uh, some some advocacy sometimes on the part of families to to point to this and, and to get that done and we're going to talk a little bit about what that looks like and, and so when you get to high school especially those last couple of years of high school you're going to start saying what are we going to do when we leave high school that is a question every student reflects on some students want to go to college some students want to go to a vocational school. Some students aren't sure what they want to do um, and they leave school and they get a job and what happens happens. Um, but it's really important to make sure in those last couple of years of high school that that IEP start really reflecting what that student needs to support them. So the example I have is Jimmy's been attending um, the same school since second grade. Let's say it's someplace like McLeod, which is pretty small and everybody knows him. They all love him. He has a great time. He has a lot of peer support and friends. Things are going really well. He's role included in everything. Um, but he's got so many friends and supporters, his, his peers, his teachers, um, the janitor, everybody knows him and they all provide him support throughout the day. These are wonderful, natural supports. They know that, well, when the lunch line's long, we just help Jimmy get to the front so he doesn't worry about missing lunch, those kind of things all things we know we do for our kids with autism without thinking. It's really important that when, when we're starting to think about where Jimmy's headed for 18 to 21 or after he leaves school, that all of those things are in the IEP, if, if at all possible. If I'm, if I'm accommodating Jimmy academically, because I just, I, all the teachers know him, we know how to handle him, we know what he needs to take extra time on his test, or we know that he wants to leave the classroom early to make sure he gets someplace on time. All of those things are fantastic, wonderful supports, but they need to be listed on the, on the IEP. Likewise, if we have goals that we know we're helping him work on throughout the day, and sometimes you see situations where kids who've been in the same place for a long time have one goal um, about transition, and everybody's kind of working generically under that one goal, it's really important to, to think through what are we really trying to accomplish and set independent separate goals for all of the different things we're doing. Um, if we're trying to do grow, build stamina for employment because we get lost after 20 minutes and want to do something else, it's important to build a specific goal and a specific activity about that. If, if we are trying to work on social skills and we know we still have some trouble with social skills, we need those individual social skills goals. Um, really important because that may impact whether he qualifies for 18 to 21 services. One of the things that isn't out there a lot is that in order for you to get 18 to 21 services in special education, you have to have some goals you're still working on and haven't completed. If you've met all your goals in special education, they don't have to provide you 18 to 21. But if you have goals you're working on, they have to continue to educate you through age 21. So it's really important to get those goals down. Um, so if there are behavioral goals that, oh, we all know he's like that, we support, get them down on paper. If there are social skills goals, get them down. 
their vocational goals, get them down, do some really good thinking and, and, and have the student kind of lead that process of what do you want to do? What goals do you want to set? How, how do we get those down on the IEP? It's critical because you may miss out on those 18 to 21 services if you don't. And we know there's a waiting list for um, HTBF labor services. We'll talk about that soon. But no matter what happens, unless there's a crisis situation, you're not getting HTBS waiver services until you're age 21 because IDEA is a, it's a federal entitlement. So you're not at age 18 going to get those services unless again, you're in a pretty severe crisis. So even without considering the waiting list, you need those 18 to 21 services or you need to be going to some post-secondary opportunity. And those opportunities are all coming back to what's on that IEP. The other example is if somebody's going to college, um, you're going to go to the access services place in that college and you're going to bring your last IEP that you've had and they're going to look at the accommodations page. They can't do nearly everything. They can't do everything on that page, but they can, but, but that's going to be the starting place for what accommodations they need. If they don't have any accommodations listed, they may not get accommodations in, in post-secondary that they need. So the other thing to remember is that 18 to 21 services are services, they're not programs. A lot of schools, there are some school districts that have 18 to 21 programs and they have a building and they have a room people go to and that's great, but legally they're services. And that means as a school district, I'm gonna look at his, I, his goals, the accommodations that are on that last IEP, and I'm gonna serve him based on what those are. If we have one goal, and it's going to take us two hours a day to reach that goal. I may not get more than two hours a day of service from the 18 to 21 in, in my school district. So, Sean, there's a question in the chat. Oh, yeah, that, I can't see the chat. Yeah. Okay, there's a question in the chat. That's a Cal monitor it for yeah. you that says, um, are 18 to 21 services something schools want to offer, or is it something that they typically need push to? offer? That is a great question. And this is why this is complex. <laughs> Both. <laughs> um, there are some school districts that pride themselves on the work they do with the 18 to 21 population, and they have a fantastic array of services available. There are some school districts that very much want to serve these kids. They don't have a lot of resources, but they pull things together and they try to get things done. There are other districts that will you have to really push and advocate for 18 to 21. You might go through a process where when they're a junior say, so let's plan for those 18 to 21 services. And the school district says, well, let's wait and see where they are in spring of their senior year. Let's wait and see if they actually need them. Well, you know, they're going to need them. This is your kid. You, you, know, you know, you know what they deal with. They're not going to suddenly be cured of autism in two years. Um, and they're not going to suddenly gain all these social skills and independent living skills in two years. We know they're going to need them, but that's why it's so important to document on the IEP the things that they need, because there are some school districts that don't readily offer that service to folks. And Sean, or um, offer it inconsistently. Yeah. Well, I, I was going to say, in my experience, um, which is limited, mm -hmm. right, but getting broader. Um, for some of the smaller districts, sometimes it seems like our, our um, teachers or professionals who are responsible for these services aren't even really aware of it. Absolutely. No, right? they're not. They're not. Which is why I think that pre thing is like so mm -hmm. important yeah. and so dynamic because they're like out there doing all kinds of education for these people. And yes. Leah says mm -hmm. um, that the student who receives services through age 21 are legally a child under IDEA. So the district must provide the same number of hours in the school day as all other students and allow that student to access yeah. the same activities that are offered to other students. Uh, and, you, Leah. Absolutely, yeah, Leah is absolutely correct. And Leah is my guru <laughs> that I go to. <laughs> and and no, that's absolutely correct. Um, and, and so a lot of times, yes, schools aren't aware of, of that, aren't aware of that obligation. And, and so the other complexity here is that with our kids with autism, that sometimes supporting someone behaviorally who has some more complex behavioral needs in, in an employment realm or a community living realm is really complicated. And schools may 
not feel like they have the experience to know how do I bring this person into the community who has significant behavioral support needs. They're still required to do so, but that's a whole other, we've got the behavior managed in the classroom. Now we're gonna start doing work experience or community living experience, things like that. How are we going to do that in the community? Um, and just the note as we move into the next phase of what we're talking about, um, most schools don't have dedicated transition specialists and it really is, up to the parent to engage and, and push to make sure all of these things are taken care of for, for, for their child. Um, um, basically, rarely is a school going to sit down and, and go over all this and do this with you. It really is, is a, what, what the parent needs to be doing. And some of this legitimately a parent has to do because they're, we're talking about all sorts of other pieces that aren't school related, but that's a really important piece here. And Sean, I, I, do, I want to stress as well that that's why this presentation and the one that Tracy did and the one that um, um, Kimberly did um, prior to that, the Transition Academy, it's really, really important because parents need to be educated. Yep. Parents often don't know about all of these different moving pieces to the puzzle. And if they don't know about it, then how can they be the one that is being the best advocate for their child? Absolutely, right? absolutely. So, so just a note, technically in Kansas, transition planning well, should happen sooner, but it needs to start by 14. And every child has a transition page on their IEP after that point. And so it's important to start filling that in um, and talk about where the child wants to live, where they wanna work, what they wanna do in community living. And, and then you can start shaping IEP goals around that. That's all easier said than done, but but that's an important piece. When when you when you may not be aware if your child's 16, there's a transition page on their IEP, and sometimes people may gloss over that. And it's really important when that comes to focus on that and to get stuff down there. And so everybody, um, Leah put a. Uh... Um, her contact information in the chat. Make sure you're monitoring the chat so you get that information. Yeah, and I just want to do a plug for Families Together. Um, families Together, Leah and all of them, they have a fantastic website that has all sorts of information about everything that I just talked about and more. And so if you need additional information, please contact Families Together about, about all of this, these transition pieces because they really do have the resources to help help guide what the school should be doing and, and you, what you as a parent should be doing, some of those kind of things. Um, so I definitely plug families together <laughs> as go-to for all, for all of this. Um, so the next part of what I'm talking about um, is, is what I would call a transition checklist, but this is gonna get really complicated really quick. <laughs> and so you don't have to have all the answers from attending this presentation. It takes more than that. So I'm gonna run through very quickly all of the systems and services that may be able to support your child as they transition to adulthood. And the, the key word is may, because none of these are entitlements the way IDEA was. None of these are guaranteed that you're going to qualify. And some of these on paper you should qualify, but there's no guarantee it's gonna happen. So these are, all of this is why this gets so complex so quickly. Um, so the first thing we start talking about is, I know my child may need long-term care, may need supports um, throughout the rest of their life um, in order to live independently, to work in the community, things like that. They may need varying levels of support, but I know that if, based on all the things I do for them, they are gonna need these supports. They probably have an intellectual disability or have some other significant challenges that, that kind of mirror that. Um, so, so for that, there's the Kansas Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Waiver under Medicaid. And, and those are the, run through the Community Developmental Disability Organizations, the CDDO. And that's when you think about people who have who group homes or residential supports or some day supports or do supported employment, this is where that's going to come through. And, and so, the, so you can apply starting at age five. For kids with autism, and this is really important, we know that the average age of diagnosis is six and a half for boys and about 11 for girls. 
And so that means that sometimes our kids with autism, they may have another diagnosis like ADHD or something like that coming into age six or seven. They may be continually falling behind academically their peers. Um, but a lot of times our kids with autism, we don't know that they would fall into the intellectual disability category until they're in middle school or they're in high school and they start falling way, way behind. So the complexity is if I have a kiddo that we know has an intellectual disability, they have Down syndrome, um, they have Fragile X, we can absolutely diagnose that. They can apply at age five. If you don't have that diagnosis yet, and you are watching your child fall further and further behind academically until in high school, it's very clear that's not where they're headed. Um, you may be age 14, 15, 16 when you're able to apply to the CDDO. Um, my son, that was my son's trajectory. Um, every year in school, he fall, fell further and further behind and kind of plateaued in, in doing math at the first grade level and reading at the second grade level. Um, and he was in a sophomore in high school when we finally had the IQ testing done and everything out and figured out he had an intellectual disability and could apply for the CDDO. That's a lot of kids with autism who have a lot of splinter skills and, and, and kind of fool people until sometimes it's too late that they really are really do need more support than they appear to, to need. Um, so it's really important as soon as you know that my child is in this category to apply for the CDDO. And here's the rub with the CDDO, and this is the most frustrating thing in Kansas. There is a 10 year wait list for services. So my son qualified when he was 16. It's very likely he will not receive any services until he's 26 to 30 years old, um, unless big changes happen, which actually they, there may be some bigger changes happening to the system in Kansas, but for now, he won't be served till he's 25 to 30 years old. And not only that, but because I don't know when he might have residential supports, I can't downsize my house. I can't do any planning for the future because he may be with us for two, five, 10, 15 more years. And Sean, I, I don't wanna take up any of your really yeah. valuable, important time. I mean, it's just a wealth of information. But the other thing is that Sometimes even when ki our kids get diagnosed, the, the uh, professional responsible for diagnosing them doesn't know about the CDDO. Mm -hmm. So they can't even tell the family to go check into yeah. it, right? Yeah. So exactly, exactly. And it's hard, it's hard too. The other rub with this for our kids with autism is that there are a lot of kids with autism who function the way a child with an intellectual disability does in terms of their problem solving behavior, things like that. but they do not qualify because when they do the assessment and they look at where they are academically, they don't qualify for, the, for this waiver. Um, and sometimes you can fight that and appeal that and you can get that done. But sometimes some of our kids do not qualify for this long-term care, even though they need it. And Kansas, unlike Missouri or some other states, does not have an adult autism waiver, does not have an, any other service tailored to kids with autism um, for long-term care supports. So unless they qualify for this, there is no residential support for your child with autism. Um, and so the general rule is, you know, in the federal guideline, intellectual disability is an IQ of 70 or under. That's a little bit fluid because, because you still can qualify if you have other comorbid conditions or, or some other seizure disorders, things like that, and you have an IQ over 70. But our kids with autism that have few social skills, don't have problem solving ability, aren't gonna drive and have an IQ of 120, they are not gonna qualify for this, for this service, even though you know they're gonna live with you the rest of your life, most likely. So Sean, are you going to cover like SED waivers and stuff as well? Or I'm not going to talk about SED because it ends when kids are 21. And it's really, I mean, okay. there's no mental health equivalent for adult other than the generic mental health center supports, okay. so, which are not tailored for autism. Well, that is good to know because I did not know that. Yes. When, yeah, when you turn 21, you are magically cured of your SED and you didn't, and if you, and you, you don't, you don't have any of those same supports. Oh, okay, here we go. 
So the other Kari, Kari points out that as the autism is not a qualifier for SEP. It is not. No, you have right. to have more mental health stuff as well. Right. With most of our kids, you can figure out that they have something like that. But um, so so the other fun part is that to qualify for the CDDO, you first have to qualify for SSI. So because of what what are what you do for the waiver in a state is the first determination is actually that you have a disability by by social security now anybody with down syndrome or fragile x or a clear intellectual disability is going to qualify for ssi most likely our kids with autism um so so when we're talking about ssi this is the monthly payment of 800 dollars a month that they're going to get for their life and then if you work it gets reduced things there's formulas but but talk about you know a safety net for your child to have that 800 dollars a month that comes in either for they can pay so to support their household that they live in as a child or to pay you rent and and support how you're caring for them as they move forward or to become independent that's huge the challenge is that for our kids with autism just like the cdo they don't automatically qualify for getting SSI. It's a quite lengthy application process. And a lot of times kids are turned down unless they have other comorbid physical conditions the first time they apply if the only thing they have is autism. So if your child has an IQ of 90 and has only an autism diagnosis, it's not terribly likely they're going to apply unless you can demonstrate other comorbid mental health, um seizure disorder things like that or behavioral disorder conditions and, and you have very solid documentation on all of that um i know kids with autism that absolutely functionally should be qualified for ssi but there's no documentation of the supports that they need and mom mom and dad word doesn't count for social security you have to have professionals with credentials who've seen your child and can verify so the bcba the fba and the B data the bcba takes is really important in, in applying for ssi if you have another mental health professional that sees your child it's very important there's somebody that can weigh in um, to, on on your child and the kind of supports they need the psychiatrist a, what a piece of evidence for SSI is that if I'm on psychotropic meds, I obviously need a different level of supports. All of that's really important um, to, to get somebody qualified because if they send you to the social, one of the things that happens is if you don't have enough evidence you bring to the table, they'll send you to their own social security doctor and their job is to deny you social security. Um, so it is really important to engage those mental health professionals or medical professionals in advance of applying for SSI if it's not a clear cut situation with your child. And this is also a, a, an area where our discrepancy in, in access to health insurance is so pronounced because people who have decent health insurance can access those mental health professionals, but people who fall in the cracks between Medicaid and having good health insurance oftentimes cannot. And, and so so and, and and so you're left with not qualifying for the service that you really need. Um, we talk about vocational rehabilitation. Um, VR are the programs that provide supports for people with disabilities. A soldier is wounded overseas and they come home and they have a disability and VR helps them. You're born with a disability, VR helps you. And that's across the board, across any disability, whether it's mental health related or an intellectual disability or a physical disability. That means that VR is the one service that our kids with autism, we talked about all these other qualifiers, oh shoot, they may not qualify for the CDDO, SSI might be a challenge. VR is the one place that they might be able to get served if you have good documentation for their disability. And, and again, VR, the purpose of VR is to um, match you with a vendor that does job development and the job coaching and they have contacts in the community and they go out and they get you get you a job they work with high v or walgreens and they get you a job at high v or walgreens and provide job coaching etc and so the other thing you had a presentation last time from tracy on pre-ex pre-employment transitional services 
So this is a newer program that started in around 2017 federally. Kansas kind of got around to doing this this last year the right way. And, and what that basically means is if you're SSI eligible and, and also eligible for, or eligible for VR and you're 16, you're, you're age 16 to 21, you can receive pre-employment services with which, which are um, people who will sit down and work with you on career choices and job choices, job development, job coaching, They'll pay for you to get vocational training. They'll pay sometimes for degree seeking college programs and they'll assist with transportation and other things needed. So, and the one, the cool part about Pre-X is that when they partner with somebody in the community, so my son worked at a nursing home and what Pre-X does is they actually pay half of his salary to get that experience. So the nursing home pays half of his salary and pre pays half, he gets one paycheck but, but they each pay half. And that's a huge incentive for places to take a chance on, a, on having a child get work experience there. Because, hey, I get somebody to work here for half the price, even though they're getting paid, paid their, their regular wage. Sean, I missed a question in the chat about okay. um, applying for SSI. Um, the question is, is a school IEP and associated documents not enough for SSI or does there need to be another qualifier? You need to have more. Okay. Um, um, you, an IEP is good. You want the IEP. This is That's another reason to have all that stuff on the IEP we talked about, because if you apply for SSI and you have one goal and one accommodation, that's that will help kick it out. Um, you need that IEP, but you also need a medical or mental health professional signing off you certainly need a you know that if you had a diagnosis of autism done at KU Matter Children's Mercy and they gave you that report you need to include even if it was when they were four years old you need to include you need to have that um, if they take if a psychiatrist you need to have that psychiatrist help fill out paperwork on why they're treating him treating them and they'll also be asked questions on their form they fill out like do you think this person can work? And they'll probably say, based on what I've treated in the last five years that I've known them, no, they, they need, they're gonna need a lot of support to work. All those kind of things. It's important to have all of those people weigh in. If he has a pediatrician, um, your child is a pediatrician, they need to write a letter about their diagnosis, especially if they have other comorbid conditions like seizure disorders or other things that, Im Im that impair them it's important to get all of it together. And it's also important for SSI. It's probably the one system that you wanna do it right the first time. Um, you wanna have your ducks in a row when you apply, because if once you apply some clocks start ticking and you can appeal, but it's harder to get the appeal one than the initial application. You want to get it right the first time. The other thing I'll say is that for SSI, there are law firms that do nothing but specialize in helping people do deal with social security. And for complex situations like kids with autism, I sometimes send people to those law firms and they will do a fantastic job. Um, and, and it doesn't cost you any money. When you apply for SSI, um, you get back pay from the date you applied. And so they just take a third of the back pay that you get. You don't, it doesn't cost you anything to go to that law firm. So, uh -huh. so if you're confused, that's a, a route you can go. Um, so what about um, for kids that are um, in out-of-home care or if a parent dies while they're waiting to get on the, like in one of these programs, is so the process the same or? So, so it's complexity, you know, one on the CDDO side, even though there's a waiting list, there's a crisis request you can, that can be made. And so if I suddenly, if my parents both die and I no longer have anybody around me to take care of me, and I'm 19 years old, I can go into that CDDO system, to that group home, to that residential program. Um, the, the contingencies on that, so what happens when you die, who's going to be helping your child, that's a whole other piece that's, you know, independent of this process in terms of you still have to have that in place, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speed through some of this because you already have that. <laughs> um, Sorry, one, Sean. One new thing in, in Kansas, we have what's called a STEPS program run, run by KDHE, it just started July 1st. And you'll get a copy of this presentation, but, but that allows you to bypass that waiting list. 
if you're looking at employment as one of your goals. So you can apply for the STEPS program and then you will, and then you will be able to, if you go, and then you'll be able to receive some of those supports you wouldn't be getting because you're on a waiting list. And, and I urge you to go look at the STEPS website and see if that's something that you're in, you'd be interested in for your child. So we talked about a lot of this through our questions. I wanna talk about guardianship real quick. Um, that was kind of part of the question, Linda, you asked about. Um, one of the big myths is that every child with an intellectual disability needs to have a guardian. And, and we really want to talk about that most children do not need guardians. And I'll talk about why. Guardianship removes rights your child would otherwise have as, as a citizen. Um, and while Kansas law is fairly progressive in some states, convicted felons have more rights than people who have guardians. So why don't you want your child to be, why do you want your child to be their own guardian? Because then every medical system and every service that you get, including the CDDO services, things like that, interacts with your child as the primary advocate for themselves, and they have to serve your child. They're not serving the guardian. It's really important for your child. The other reason is that if your child has a guardian and you die, the state says this child needs a guardian and they'll appoint somebody to be a guardian if you don't have a clear line of succession. And so your child could end up with somebody appointed to be their guardian who doesn't know them and who doesn't understand what, what they need. Especially for kids with autism, that's really important. If they're their own guardian, then they have to be listened to, even if they have trouble communicating. They have to be listened to and they have to be supported to do what they want to do. So one of the big myths is as soon as your child turns 18, they turn into a pumpkin unless they have a guardian. That's just not true. Um, the school, medical providers, everybody else can interact with that child. And like, my child's his own guardian. And I've not had one single issue in the entire time. Um, of, every medical provider has a proxy notice that you can sign that says, this is OK for you to talk to this person just like it would be for an elderly, elderly, for an elderly parent. Um, there's no reason to get guardianship just because you wanna do all that. The other thing that's really important is that people think, well, if I am a guardian, then if he does something to, to have money stolen from him or goes out and buys $2,000 worth of video games, you know, without my permission, then, then he's not liable for that. Oh no, he's completely liable for that. But having a guardian doesn't protect you from any liability, whether it's financial or criminal. So if, if my child who has a guardian signs a piece of paper to buy something, to go buy a car, they have no business doing that, you're still gonna have to pay for the car or deal with how to, how to deal with that paper that was signed. Um, Likewise, it does not protect you at all from, from the criminal justice system. So if I have a guardian, the fact that I have a guardian and I shoplift to something matters zero to the criminal justice system. Um, and so having a guardian isn't going to protect your child from financial liability. It's not going to protect them from criminal justice issues they may suffer. So, and, and then the other thing in Kansas, which is really good in Kansas guardianship law, guardians cannot prevent somebody from voting. Kansas guardians cannot prevent somebody from seeing whoever they want to see, unless there's a restraining order that goes through normal due process. So guardians don't have, guardians cannot prevent somebody from getting married actually in Kansas. So as a guardian, you're, you have, you, there's nothing you get other than telling the state that this person is of diminished capacity. And if you die, I'm gonna send, set him up with somebody who doesn't know who he is. It's always, unless there's extreme circumstances, better for your child to remain their own guardian. And there's nothing magic that happens. Likewise, the schools are required, even if your child's their own guardian, to still involve you in the IEP. I've never known of a school when a child turns 18 and says, I'm signing myself out of school to allow that to happen without involving the, the previous parent um, in some capacity. So there's alternatives to guardianship. It's really important. And I'm gonna to go to my, there's, there's things like supported decision-making, which we'll talk about. 
There's living will, special needs, trust, durable powers for attorney. I have a DPOA for my son for healthcare and for financial, just in case we need it. But it's not a guardianship. He can still make his own choices. I can just use that to step in, especially in a healthcare situation, if he really can't communicate for himself. Um, there's limited guardianship. So you don't have to be a full-blown guardian for your child. You can just be a guardian. You can just be a guardian for um for healthcare reasons or for finance or for financial reasons or be a conservator. You don't you can do all of that before being a full guardian. And we really our law says guardianship should be a method of last resort only after other lesser alternatives have been explored. The reason we talk about this so much in Kansas is because Kansas, 75% of people who have an intellectual disability have a guardian. In other states, only about 35% have a guardian. And there's nothing magic about the demographics of those other states. People in Kansas are not the more severely impacted by their intellectual disability. It's that we have a bad practice of doing too many guardianships in Kansas. So it's important, if at all possible, to encourage people to be their own guardians as a part of that transition process. And again, parents get, I get calls from parents panicked saying, oh no, he turned 18, I need to spend $2,000 to go get a guardianship for my child. And you talk through that, no, you really don't. Except there are extreme circumstances. Everybody has different circumstances. There are kids that have significant chronic health conditions and cannot speak for themselves. And you probably, yeah, you need to be their guardian. But for kids with autism who are verbal and have opinions and, and make decisions about their life, you probably don't need to do that. Again, unless there's extreme exigent circumstances that that make you think that's the case. And so supported decision-making is really cool. There's a bill in the Kansas House right now about that along with other states. And it basically is a bill that says that we're gonna codify into law the practice that I can sign a piece of, I can have a piece of paper that says that my neighbor, Joe, who's an accountant, is gonna go with me to the bank and the bank has to honor his participation in, 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 in advising me on financial issues. And so I don't have to spend $2,000 for a guardianship. I don't have to spend $500 for a DPOA. I can, I can do the support, informal supported decision-making agreement, especially for folks that have natural supports that are wanting to help them. And so that, that's an exciting thing coming hopefully very soon. And I'm gonna take five minutes to talk about self-determination. So the whole goal of all of this is self-determination so that people can act as causal agents and actors in their own life. We know through research that kids with disabilities um, often lose their locus of control. So when I have ADHD and I study for my test and I forget to bring my pencil to the class and the teacher says, well, you don't get, you get a zero on the test because you forgot to bring your pencil, even though the name of the class isn't bringing, the, bringing your pencil. Um, that, what's the likelihood that child's gonna study for a test again or try to make effect change academically again? The same is true for kids with autism and, and how they do social skills. They try and fail socially multiple times and then they stop trying at some point. They try and fail in employment sometimes and stop trying. So it's really important that we do things that research tells us can help the kids build their self-determination skills. And people, we've researched that shows that people who are more self-determined are more likely to live independently, be employed, be integrated in communities, and be able to recognize and avoid abuse. So when we talk about what is our big fear as a parent is, is abuse, neglect, exploitation, teaching self-determination skills is the single best defender against, against abuse, neglect, and exploitation. So think about, can you develop your own short and long-term goals? Can you identify opportunities and take action on them? Um, all of those things are things that it's possible. We have the tools and materials to train kids with intellectual disabilities and especially autism to do, to do these things. There's something called the self-determined learning model of instruction. That's an evidence-based research proven tool, which would be a great topic for a future IBT parent cafe. <laughs> Um, um, about how to teach kids to set goals. We'll take a referral on that, Sean. Hopefully uh, yeah. you'll present it. So, no, no, so, so, and I, I wouldn't be the one to, so it would best to present that real quick. 
there's actually a self-determination inventory you can take and you can have your child or take it or have a parent fill it out for your child and see where which domains of self-determination they're strong in and which they need more help in and then you can design goals around around this sdi that's so, that's totally cool sean there's a couple of questions sure absolutely um, talking about guardianship what about nonverbal and severely autistic children or well, young adults you know we, we as i said there are there are folks that have really significant disabilities, especially folks that have chronic health conditions that go along with those significant disabilities and they're nonverbal. That's the case where I'd probably be the guardian. That just simplifies a lot of stuff. But that's a small percentage of our autism population. Um, the majority of our autism population is verbal. The majority does not have an intellectual disability or has a borderline intellectual disability or just a learning disability. Um, so the majority of our autism population and, and our intellectual disability population are kids for whom I would not recommend even their guardian. You know, so, so examples would be somebody has a chronic health condition, somebody has been in and out of the criminal justice system and, and, and really has significant issues there. Those are cases that might, but that's not nearly the majority of our kids. That's not 75% of our kids. Um, so, so yeah, when we say that there are kids for whom, yeah, they need a guardian, but. So there, there's another question in uh -huh. there too is, do you have resource connections for individuals who have become adults, but were never diagnosed as a child? Yes. Maybe so, not so, wanting to have their child labeled or. Well, well, so, so yeah, let's talk about that. I, there is a piece I skipped over for time talking about how sometimes our kids with autism who are higher functioning don't like to be labeled with a disability or don't like to associate with people with disabilities. And that's such a hard thing to help somebody grow into recognizing that I am a person that needs accommodations and support. Um, that's really that's really hard. Um, I, I think what the number one call we get, we get two calls at KCART. One, earlier, I'm, I'm a newly diagnosed parent and I, I got to figure out what to do to get early interventions for my kid. And the second is I'm 25 and I think I have autism and I never got a diagnosis. And so actually the KU Psychological Clinic in Lawrence will see people on a sliding fee scale and actually do that adult diagnosis. I think Kari does too at IBT. And IBT will too, yeah. Uh -huh. And so um, uh, one thing that I want to put in here as we're wrapping up, questions and comments and whatnot is we're in the middle of setting our agenda for the next set of um, um, Parent Cafe topic series. So if you guys have any suggestions on things that you'd be really interested in hearing about, drop them in the chat because we'll save the chat and then we'll go out and look for individuals that um, would be able to present on that. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. And I also want to yeah. plug, I saw in chat, Leah talk about family employment awareness training. Absolutely check that link out. It is a fantastic program if your child and if you bring your kid with you. So if your child's interested in employment and they have IDD or autism, bring them to that mm -hmm. and look at when they're coming to your town because it is a wonderful program. I need to plug our Autism Across the Lifespan Conference, which is April 8th at KU Edwards campus. And it is in person, we are hoping all things being equal, if things maintain, it will be in person, mask required, and you can sign up there. Very excited if, if you're interested in, in signing up or more information, please, please look at attending that. And then the other thing I was going to plug is we are actually have a study at Case Kansas University Center on Developmental Disabilities called the Self-Determined Career Design Model. It's based on that self-determination research. And it's basically a telehealth intervention that works with your child who's, who's 16 or over to work with a facilitator to do, to do job and career exploration and choices and to set goals around working. And, and, so, and, and so this is the, app, the screening to go through to apply if you're interested in that. And we're actively recruiting for folks to, to start the process in May. So, so definitely, if you're interested in your um, child participating in that. Can you drop that link in the chat, that one in the previous one about the... Um, yes. Just, yeah, copy that. And... I will do that.
And if anybody is interested in any other information, drop your um, contact information in the chat, along with what other information you would like, um, and or uh, let us know what future topics you would like to um, um, hear, right, or have us present on. Um, thanks, Alice, for the KU Clinic, Autism Across the Lifespan, and Sean, if you would go up like a couple of slides. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought I copied that. I don't know why I did. I don't know why I didn't copy. That's weird. Okay, let me try that again. I think. Okay. Does anybody have any last questions for Sean before we wrap up? I just want to say, Sean, uh, you know, as always, I'm over the top impressed with your knowledge, right? Your knowledge and your skill, your advocacy. It's like, I know that you say Leah is the one that you go to, but you're the one I go to. No. I, I mean, anytime I need anything, it's always like, talk to Sean Swindler. He's the one that knows mm -hmm. about this whole thing. And some of the kids that I've worked with as they age, you know that I have come to you for yeah. that. So. Yeah. Um, I really want to thank you. Thanks for taking time out of, I know how incredibly busy you are. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to be able to present to us. It was wonderful information. And um, is, do you have a contact information? Do you want to put your email in there or something? I do. Let me, let me, let me share the final, the final shot, slide. All right. Here. Here, here we go. I did that. So I'm just going to go ahead and type it in the chat because I know it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just Swindler. S Swindler. Swindler. At yeah. .edu. Mm -hmm. I'll, uh, I'll also provide it in the follow up email. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. Hi. We have our autism group. support group. And we do have our Autism Resource Center at KCART, and this is what we're here for. So when families contact us or email us, we are very happy to talk to you about all of this stuff, and that's what we're here for, so. All right. Well, once again, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of ideas, high-functioning young adult support group, um, um, looking at all the waivers that are available in Kansas and having information on how to be able to get those. Um, um, and and, and I just want to say practically the only waiver that applies to autism, the autism waiver is what it is, right. but it's the IDD waiver. There's not, you know, the SED waiver and things like that are not, are for kids, younger kids maybe, but they're, they're very different animals and you need somebody to talk about those that's in that system so yeah and so i think um speaking to that though is like even just having a conversation about what is the autism waiver and and who can get it right it doesn't necessarily have to be people that are low income mm -hmm. but as soon as you get on it it opens up the state medicaid plan and allows you access to other services so even that kind of information i think would be beneficial so Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much. I don't want to keep anybody longer um, since we're already two minutes over and I know everybody has a time commitment. So thanks for coming and we look forward to seeing you at some of our next present topic presentations. Look for that. We'll be getting those sent out soon. Thanks, Sean. Thank you.